Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along to uh, this uh, CCH seminar. Uh, our speaker today is Christina Birnbaum, who joined USQ in April this year, and uh, she is a member of the new School of Agriculture and Environmental Science. May I say that this is kind of introductory seminar from you? Yeah. So you are uh, talking about uh, uh, your career and uh, your research, yeah. uh, and this will be a nice uh, introduction to CCH and also to people on Zoom. Um, hello, everyone on Zoom. We have 13 participants um, who joined this this meeting. Um, the seminar will be recorded and hopefully it will be available on Open Plant Pathology website. So Christina, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> so do I need to do anything else here? No, we just start? I don't know. I think, I think <laughs> you can just... Just start. Okay, no worries. All right. Um, thank you, Levi. And hello, people in the room and people on Zoom. Thanks for joining us on this cold Friday morning. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you for the intro, um, introduction and invitation to come and talk today here. Um, yeah, so my name is Christina and I'm a lecturer um, at the school. And today, as Levi said, I will give a very brief overview of sort of my past research and current research um, and so forth. So the title of my talk is, as you can see on the slides, um, Understanding Plant Microbe Soil Interactions to Improve Plant Conservation and Restoration Outcomes. All right, hopefully this will work. <laughs> okay, so since I'm new, as Levi said, to USQ and CCH, I thought I'll provide a brief snapshot of my past. So you might have guessed my accent is not Australian or anything else. I'm actually from Estonia originally. Um, in case people's geography is a bit mm, for that part of the world, that's where Estonia is. Um, and I actually moved to Sydney to do my PhD at Macquarie University with Michelle Leishman. So I did my PhD there, finished it in 2013. Then I went to Perth, uh, Western Australia, where I did my first postdoc with um, Neil Enright um, and Joe Fontaine. And after that, I went to... Uh, Louisiana, where I did my postdoc with Emily Farr at Tulane University. Then I had, a, I'm not going to call it a break, but I was on maternity leave for two years, roughly, um, before I joined um, Deakin and RMIT universities in Melbourne. Um, and now I'm here, USQ, <laughs> since April 4th. Um, and I guess I can just briefly also say, so my background is broadly plant ecology or plant invasion ecology. And then during my PhD, I really got into the below ground microbial ecology, focusing predominantly on the, um, the mutualistic microbes. Um, I'm also associate editor in plant ecology, um, a peer review journal. And in 2016 or 17, together with my colleague, Eleonora Gidi from Western Sydney Uni, we co-founded this um, ecological site of Australia plant soil ecology research chapter. Um, that basically the aim of this was to bring together people from various tracks of life um, and expertise, but who work in Australia on plant microbial interactions um, to basically support each other, network, create um, events at the conferences, uh, the ESA annual conferences. And also we have a few online activities as well. So we're on Twitter a lot. Um, that's where we sort of share information, knowledge, workshop. Um, it obviously has an ecological angle, but you know we all kind of tend to work on different bits of different things like ecology and agriculture and agroecosystems. So I think there's something for everyone. Um, at USQ, I'm now, as I said, um, lecturer, uh, but also major convener for ecology and conservation. So that's a snapshot of me <laughs> very quickly. Um, I always find when I start in a new place, it's good to add a fun fact about myself. This is not quite myself, this is a fungi, but I thought it's really cool. A couple of years ago, I discovered that there's a fungi, Leucococcinus burnbaumii, that has the same uh, species name than my last name. And it's just an interesting backstory. So it's apparently was uh, named by a um, garden inspector in Prague, which is in Czech Republic. Um, who had the same uh, last name like I do. I'm not sure if we're related, but I probably should dig in and see. <laughs> Obviously, we both love fungi and microbes and that sort of stuff. 
So a few things about the fungi that I relate to that they don't like cold weather, I absolutely hate it. So hence I'm here, um, they like to be in tropics and subtropics. I haven't actually seen this fungi yet. So um, now that I'm in the right climatic zone, I might go and forage for it and get a photo together with us for the next talk. <laughs> so that's the fun part, okay. <laughs> so now to the science. So. I saw this cover. This is the science uh, magazine cover from May from last month. And it was all about the systemic microbiome and how microbial communities affect um, humans. But it really talked to me because this sort of description of that, um, I guess, special issue or this special theme in science is about how humans have many distinct and interconnecting microbial populations that exert systemic effects throughout their body. And so understanding those ways, the ways these microbial communities interact, provides a really good insight into how the collective microbiome shapes the health and the disease. And you wonder why am I talking about human microbiomes if we're actually talking about plants so well, but this is just really to kind of uh, help you understand how I view the role of microbes in plant health, because I really do the, think that there's a lot of overlaps and exactly the same mechanism working for humans. Um, because we all know that now gut microbiome affects, you know, our health, our weight, our likelihood of getting diseases, and I feel with plants is the same thing. So that's why I put it up there. So just a brief outline on my talk today. So I'll start off with talking why soil microbes are important, which is a little bit like preaching to the choir, because I'm pretty sure everyone, we're all on the same page, but nevertheless, for people maybe on Zoom from various backgrounds. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the utility of plant soil feedbacks, um, then the role of soil microbes in plant invasions with some examples from my work um, and our collective work, and then the role of soil microbes also in restoration ecology. Um, and then I'll finish off by giving just a quick snapshot of my current research. Okay, so obviously I think we all can agree that uh, on all these aspects of the benefits that soil microbes provide to the soil and the plants by obviously being the key players in decomposition, humus formation, nutrient cycling, nitrogen fixation, via specifically legumes and rhizobia, biodegradation, soil structure, the disease um, and pest control and growth promotion. So I would say these are probably the key functions that the soil microorganisms serve, um, at least for me as a new plant ecologist that we are very keen to explore and understand. Um, so I'll start off with the plant soil feedback um, and why it's very has been very useful in ecology since late 90s, early 2000s to really understand what's happening below ground. So just a quick question, how many people know plant soil feedback sort of make, I guess the, the idea of it? You're all familiar, yeah? Who, who has heard of it before? Hands up. Three people in the room, okay. Um, this is not a lecture, so I'm not gonna <laughs> chat, ask the Zoom people, but um, okay, raise hand. Okay, Catherine, okay, so four people out of 20. Okay, cool. Well, this slide then serves its purpose because it's quite detailed um, uh, to explain why we're using plant soil feedbacks. So obviously in late 90s, early 2000s, as the technological advances really allowed us to start doing you know, basic sequencing and kind of move past the culturing, we, we started to really be able to see what is actually happening below ground with plants. And so in ecology, um, this plant soil feedback approach has been very, very widely used and, um, and has really helped us understand some of the patterns, positive and negative, um, of the below ground soil communities on plants. And so what it essentially is, is that you have your two stages in that experiment. So you have your what's called the conditioning phase and you have your testing phase. And so you have your say species A and you have your species B. And so what happens during the conditioning phase is that there is this species specific interactions with microbes um, that generally result in the divergence um, of soil microbial communities. And so in the figure at the bottom the part, the testing, the alpha and beta of the, so for the soil communities. And then in the testing phase, what you're doing is you're just growing then species A in again in its own soil. So for example, in the conditioning phase, you split that soil say in half, 
half of that soil you use again to grow species A again, and the other half you use to grow the other species that you're interested in to grow in that soil. And then at the end of the testing phase, you then compare how did the species A perform in its own soil relative when it was grown in the other species soil. So you do that sort of kind of cross um, comparison. There's many other ways now that you can sort of do those plant cell feedback, but this was the sort of the start, how it started, like different people do it a bit differently, um, but this is the sort of basis of it. And at the end, we can then say, we can estimate the effect size and the biomass differences um, between when, I'm, when the plant is grown in its own soil as opposed to in the soil of other species. And then we end up with those two sort of groups of responses we can call positive plant soil feedback. And positive plant soil feedback basically means that species A grew much better in species A soil as opposed to in the soil of other plants. So this would be a positive uh, plant soil feedback. And in a sort of plant ecology context, that really um, actually results in reduced plant community diversity, uh, because if a lot of, if all the species support their own growth in the soil and the growth of their proper gills, there will be a reduction in species diversity because one species can become really dominant, and that's what happens with invasive species a lot. As opposed to the positive feedback, there's the negative plant cell feedback, and this is where if species A is grown in its own soil, it actually will perform worse um, than in, when it's grown in the soil of other plant species. And that's a negative feedback. And so in plant community context, this um, will result in increased plant community diversity, because usually what happens there, the mechanism is that the plants accumulate pathogen, fetched pathogens in the soil that then limit their proper, proper gill establishment and growth nearby that um, host um, like mother plant. So this is a bit related to this janssen connell hypothesis of, um, of uh, species coexistence. So this is the sort of snapshot of plant cell feedbacks. And I've used this sort of framework a lot in my work and my PhD specifically. And so this, field, I, I guess I can say, really boomed in early 2000s. Um, and this paper was a, it's sort of considered like a landmark paper by John Cleron Um, I was fortunate enough during my PhD to actually go to his lab in Guelph and actually learn about the plant cell feedback process. So this was really valuable for me. Um, but yeah, he published this landmark study where he compared, he compared five invasive species and, and five rare species um, in Canada. And then he did that exact plant soil feedback experiment where he grew the invasive species in their own soil and in the soil of other species um, and the same for rare species. And so what he found essentially, so on the y-axis you have the growth of plants, so relative growth of plants in their own soil compared to others. And if the, if the bars are above zero, that's a positive plant cell feedback. And if they are below, that's a negative plant cell feedback. And so this really neatly showed exactly what I was just telling before, is that the invasive species generally have a positive plant soil feedback. So they are re doing really well in their own soil. And that's why you often see those monocultures of one invader. Uh, whereas the rare species, potentially why they are rare is this mechanism, is that they in their soils sort of self-control their distribution, which is essentially detrimental to them, but it really, kind of explained in a new way why some species are rare and why some species are abundant. And that was to do with those microbial communities below ground. So I was thinking since we have a mix of people um, who study more natural ecosystems and who are more interested in agricultural ecosystems, there's this great paper by Mario et al from 2018, published in Trends and Ecology and Evolution, where he, being a mostly, I think, ecologist, he tried to merge and explain the utility of the plant cell feedback in, um, in agricultural systems as well, that it could be used um, and what we can learn from each other, so to speak. And so this is just an overview of how, what sort of expectations would we have for plant cell feedbacks in natural systems. So usually in natural systems, we have um, high species diversity, um, the, the plant cell feedbacks are generally, they could be either or negative or positive. Um, there's a high species and trait diversity. Um, the nutrient cycle is generally closed. The soil biota is really diverse because you have those different species interacting. Um, and there's quite into, um, complex soil um, trophic interactions as well. 
And so just on this figure, the, the red lines indicate um, negative plant cell feedback, the blue lines indicate positive plant cell feedback, and the circles are just mutualists, and the triangles are the pathogens. So it's just illustrative. Whereas in agricultural systems, obviously we have mostly monoculture because that's the species of interest that we're growing. Um, often there's external resource inputs in terms of like fertilizers. The soil biota tends to become less diverse over time as the soil is exhausted and the, the trophic interactions are quite simplified generally. Um, however, again, this is a figure from his paper. I really liked how he showed that, you know, in agricultural systems, we can learn to harness what we know from natural systems to make the agricultural output more efficient. And so there's just the three different pathways that they were proposing is that, for example, number one, optimizing cropping systems. So if we um, understand better in the natural ecosystems, for example, species, beneficial species interactions, we can harness that to then kind of applied in the cropping systems as well, where we select for those microbial communities like rhizobia or specific rhizobial species to enhance the, the, the crop species growth. Another thing is also number two is the disease resistance and pest control. So this is just, for example, in terms of above ground, um, knowing what we know about different species um, below ground root traits um, and how different root traits are related to, diff, um, to more efficient or less efficient nutrient and water acquisition strategies, if we can harness that and either genetically modify or breed species selectively that have those root traits that have been shown in the natural ecosystems to be really beneficial, then again, we could improve our um, cropping outcomes. Um, the inoculation pathway there at the bottom is just again to select from microbial communities that would provide better resistance to um, pathogens and pests. And then the last one, number three here, is um, increasing the resource use efficiency. So it's basically all about, you know, in the, in the cropping systems, we have that one species, but if we can kind of figure out the interactions and um, pairing of different cropping and intercropping species that would contribute to, you know, bigger litter inputs, more nutritious litter that then can be recycled by the crop species, um, to, to um, contribute to nutrient retention and recycling and acquisition as well. So these are just very generic and they're very theoretical. I know you might ask how can we actually apply this? Um, but this is, I think, good sort of pathways to think how uh, we can learn from sort of each other. Um, I like that they also provided the reverse picture, how you can use the agricultural knowledge that we have already from agricultural sciences to improve conservation and restoration. And I think that's really neat. I really like it um, because we're all interconnected. Agriculture is in the environment, obviously, and the environment can support agriculture. So in this case, um, they were proposing, for example, what we can learn from cropping systems is that obviously, number one, deciphering those complex plant cell interactions. So obviously in cropping systems, we have that monoculture, uh, lower below ground diversity, where we can really see or what plant above and below ground uh, um, compartments work best together. And knowing that, which is essentially like in a glass house as well, we have that one species, we, ha we can then engineer almost those perfect plant soil interactions and also inoculating more mutualistic organisms to promote, for example, species that are rare and then suppress the species that are dominant already, for example, in conservation. Um, the point number two here is, uh, uh, understanding better restoration after disturbance. And it's really sort of, again, understanding those sort of single species interactions um, between plants and microbes to then, for example, inoculate some uh, uh, field sites where there's a lot of inv invasive species with pathogens to then control their distribution. And again, support more rare species or funda foundational species, um, especially after disturbance where the soil is really, um, basically devoid of any beneficial microbes and so on and so forth. So you, I think you're getting the idea. And the last one is the multifunctionality. So I guess the point of me showing those three, si uh, three slides from this paper is just, I like how they um, uh, show this complementarity between the different systems. So I think there's, for me, especially moving forward and trying to find you know, research ways and um, continuing here at CCH as well. So this is, this is a useful, I think, 
kind of framework. Okay, so now I'll get more towards the, my past research. So as I said, I sort of started doing um, plant invasion ecology. And so using that plant soil feedback um, mechanism understanding. So in invasion, it has been widely used. And basically this is again, like uh, more of a conceptual diagram, but basically what it shows is that imagine a native range of forest, right? That's undisturbed. So you have your species diversity, you have some spruces, you have some other trees. And generally in those sort of undisturbed ecosystems, so here you have those two species and you have those uh, arrows showing the interactions between species. And generally what happens is that plants experience this negative plant soil feedback, and that's what keeps them um, in check and uh, the different species can coexist. However, if the, there's a successful invasion that for example, in our case here spruce, it, it then starts to dominate and it's getting that positive plant soil feedback as shown on the, on the plus here under the spruce. So it has a positive plant soil feedback with itself, but it's also benefits from the soil microbial communities of other species. So in that case, the native species are getting suppressed because they're still experiencing that negative feedback, whereas the invasive species continue to um, spread. And obviously in the case of unsuccessful invasion, these patterns would be reversed, right? So one of the key questions in ecology is like why some species become invasive and some don't. Um, there's many different mechanisms there, but yeah, and we can dissect it later, but if we look at the whole soil communities, then um, a lot can be explained by looking at these sort of interactions. So this is the sort of framework for specifically invasion ecology. So taking that all in mind, so there's, yes, um, one table from 2006, it's a bit old, but it really summarized uh, a lot of different um, uh, invasive species experiments. And so basically this table just shows the, some of the main species um, that have been looked at by invasion ecologists and then tested in the glass house, those uh, feedback effects. And you can see if it's a, uh, there's either effect of the soil biota in the native range, um, effect of soil biota in a non-native range and whether there is a biogeographical effect. And that basically means that there is a differential response to the soil microbes. And you can see that for most species, there is um, there's variable effect, but often it's a positive um, plant soil feedback. So that's what this sort of shows. So for my PhD, um, I studied uh, legumes, um, acacia species. Um, and so because we knew all that information, how plant soil feedback explain um, species distribution, we really wanted to apply that in Australia for acacias. So acacias are really, they're native to Australia, but they have become um, big problematic invaders in most of the Mediterranean regions of the world. So California, um, Chile, Italy and Spain, um, South Africa, and also New Zealand. But the funny thing about acacias is, is that because there's over a thousand species of them, some of them are actually native to the Eastern states of Australia, and some of them are actually unique to the Western Australia. But because Australia is a continent country, people just think, you know, it's native here, so, so it's fine. But there's actually some problems with some of the species that are native in the eastern states in Western Australia and vice versa. So we, we wanted to understand how much then the soils contribute to these um, patterns that we see. So we had um, four acacias, acacia saligna, acacia longifolia, acacia cyclops, and acacia longifolia and one of the close relative um, of legumes, uh, Parasyrianthes lofanta. And so what we did is that, I was very fortunate for my PhD, I got to travel all the Eastern and, and Eastern states and the Western Australia to collect um, plant and soil from several populations of each species and then bring it back to Sydney to do that plant soil feedback experiment with more than thousand pots to test for these effects. And so let's have a look, what did I find? Well, um, so this is just results from our papers. So basically when we perform that plant soil feedback experiment, like I showed you before, so we have our five species on the y-axis, you have the total biomass, um, and on the x-axis, you have the soil origin. And M stands for native, and I stands for invasive range, yeah? And so basically what we did is that, for example, for acacia cyclops, I grew it in its native soil, and then in its non-native soil. 
But the difference was I also collected seed material, not just soil. And so the above letters would also, these are the, um, uh, the seed origin of, of, the, of the species. It gets a little bit complicated, I'm sorry, but it's basically, yes, we have the seed and soil and we tested for both. Um, and surprisingly, what we found is that there was no effect of the soil at all on these species. So they performed equally well in both, but actually it was the seed origin. So the above ground plant traits that explained the variation in the biomass. So that was really interesting and it was exactly contrary to what we expected. Um, and um, yeah, so that was, that was the sort of um, the main message from this work. And there was a, yeah, the significant effect of seed origin specifically for two species, um, Acacia cyclops and Saligna. And so we published that. And then we also looked at the specifically the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So we, since they're legumes, um, for base, they do rely a lot on the rhizobia and other uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria to really establish and grow in those early stages. So we had a look um, at that and we did some TRFLP analysis for more community. And then we did some sequencing as well, both for the nitrogen fixing bacteria and the fungi. And so what we found generally that there was no difference in what microbial communities were in their soils. And that then explains why the plant soil feedback experiment didn't show that as well. So it, I thought it would be quite a challenge to publish like negative results because we didn't find the plant soil effect, but we managed. So I got four papers out of the PhD, so that was okay. Um, so I was happy with that. But yeah, so it just provided basically a bit more context and to the plant soil feedback literature, you know, basically showing that these responses are species specific and they're also geographically um, different. So it's not all blanket sort of results. Um, so then I continued um, working on invasive species in Louisiana, where I focused on the grass species, um, Phragmites australis. So here is just a picture showing um, the problem, the extent of the problem of the species, it forms those, those really dense monocultures in the coastal areas that um, suppresses the native species diversity and really changes the soil communities as well. Um, and these are just on the map showing our sites, um, different sites we have across the salinity gradient, which is just the abiotic filter for the, the species um, and, and, and could be for the below ground as well. So this is just sort of in, in summary, the, the project. And what we found there was that, so we established field sites where we had the monoculture of uh, Phragmites australis. Then we had the edge sort of uh, transect. And then we had the native community transect that didn't have the Phragmites australis. So this was the gradient. And then we sampled soil and roots from all of these three transects. Um, and what these figures here below just basically show is that we found that the root fungal in the sphere composition strongly differed between Phragmites australis and the native community. So, and you can see on those PCA um, figures at the bottom as well, is that there was a strong difference um, by community type, the biotic context um, for the, um, the invasive species. So basically what it means is that Phragmites had really unique uh, microbial communities in its soil compared to the native community. But more interestingly, we found um, published in this paper that the, um, the Phragmites also uh, had a bigger pathogen, um, fungal pathogen accumulation in its roots compared to the native species. And so this could be, so this was both for roots and the soils. Um, and that really could again explain why it's doing so well. So aside from the fact that it's just really big plant above ground providing all that shade, it has really different root system. And then it also accumulates those pathogens that again, they are not um, in a separate glass house we showed, they are not detrimental to Phragmites itself, but they are actually suppressing the native community. And that explains the mechanism why it's so widespread and such a global problem really. It's not just in the US, it's in Europe, it's in Australia as well. Um, so that was really interesting and that sort of uh, supported the previous research. So that was my postdoc in Tulane. Um, so now I'll move from the invasive species ecology uh, to restoration ecology. 
Um, so restoration ecology is obviously a much more applied field that's sort of fundamental ecology. And it really tries to take that plant microbial knowledge and then apply it to the real world scenarios. Um, so what generally happens during restoration is, this is just a schematic figure showing that um, as the soils get more disturbed, there will be more bacteria dominated usually, and the fungal communities are um, reduced. And then restoration ecologists often, when you have, for example, you know, imagine a mining of sands and mining scenarios. So for example, in Western Australia, you have this really biodiverse um, uh, communities of plants, very unique, um, that are cleared up um, to dig out the soil for the mining industry. And then if you want to restore that, what do you do? Um, so often restoration ecologists want to take the shortcuts as shown on the red lines. So you want to kind of bypass the whole succession and get that, you know, to the end result to support the plant species you want to grow in restoration. So how do you do that? And so using that plant soil um, ecology sort of understanding and feedbacks is really one way to kind of get to those shortcuts. Um, there's some work that has really shown uh, so by Lidi Kodatel, 2019, that in during ecological restoration, when you have those bare um, disturbed sites, what they found is that the soil microbial communities, there was a um, large amount, uh, as shown on, on the red, in the red, in those pie charts, of opportunistic taxa. So these are these taxa that are potentially pathogens. They are, they're not really forming any relationship with any plants, but they have detrimental effects. And then as you continue with ecological restoration and the species start to reestablish and you get this upper story and understory, what they found is that there was an increase in the niche adapted taxa. So this is basically more, and I think it makes sense because as plants start to form those relationships, mutualistic um, and different symbiotic relationships with microbes, there's increase in those um, more specific niche adapted taxa. And so this really shows the utility of ecological restoration and then inform but potentially like soil inoculations and, and those species interactions. And the last figure here is just showing um, they had so they had Australia wide samples. Um, and so in the in the natural communities, they, they found those in, as in blue, those more niche adapted beneficial microbial taxa. And so we so during my postdoc in at Murdoch Uni, so I had a project with, um, in collaboration with industry partners, Tronox, um, uh, where we went to the Kuljalu mine site, uh, north of Perth, and we collected the soils from there. So what they're doing is that they're doing exactly that sun mining, um, uh, uh, sun mining processes where they basically remove the native vegetation, they stockpile it somewhere away, and then they perform the, the operations, obviously, of the mining, and then they want to restore those pits using that vegetation and that stockpiled soil um, that they stripped years ago. But never, but no one really knows is that does this, does this work? Will the revegetation actually work? Um, they just assume that based on earlier literature that it, it might work and the species will regenerate. Um, so we wanted to actually test that. So what we did is we went and collected uh, those different stockpiles. So we had stockpiles that range from one years old, um, what is it, two, three, five, and 10. So 10 year old stockpiles of soils that were just laying there. And we brought them back to the glass house and we used Acacia saligna just as a bioassay species to grow in those soils and see how well the species would actually perform. And it makes sense to use Acacia saligna because it's a legume, it's a quite fast growing legume and it's often used in restoration to, um, the, to uh, uh, start the revegetation process. And so what we found is, um, this is from our paper showing the total above ground and below ground biomass of Acacia saligna. And we also looked at the specific root length, SRL, L, nodule biomass. So um, evidence of rhizobia forming, um, associations with this Acacia saligna and also AMF colonization. And so what we found is that we had, sorry, we had also a reference site as marked in gray. So a reference site is just adjacent undisturbed um, soil. And so what we found is that the total biomass of this Acacia saligna really decreased significantly in those 10 year old soils um, that's been laying there uh, in those stockpiles. But surprisingly, we found that actually the specific root length 
and AMF colonization in those 10 year old um, uh, plant, uh, soils uh, that when the plant was growing it was really high. And so it seems that above ground, the plant didn't do very well, but below ground, it was sort of exploring for nutrients and water and, and potential fungi and bacteria to, um, to, to support its growth. And another thing as well for the nodule biomass, I just want you to see. So the nodule biomass of this acacia was also the, the lowest in the 10 year old soils. And we couldn't understand really why. Um, then we used those soils to do some sequencing. And so we described all the um, nitrogen fixing bacterial communities um, and also fungi uh, in a separate paper. And so this is this paper where it's basically showing the fungal communities in the bottom um, uh, triangle, pairwise comparisons, and bacterial communities in the top um, triangle in pairwise com uh, comparisons. And basically what we found was that both fungal and bacterial richness declined as the stockpile age increased. However, fungi actually um, uh, sort of gained the compositional, uh, compositional um, structure similar to the reference sites better than bacteria. So this is basically everything that's in those squares, I should have said that everything that's black is um, significant uh, effect size. Um, and everything that's white is not. So in terms of those pairwise comparisons. And so what we also found is that in the 10 year old soils, when we sequenced them, there was no Brady rhizobium. So there was no, none of that mutualistic uh, rhizobial taxa that Saligna needs <clears throat> potentially often associates with to grow really well. And that really nicely complemented our glasshouse results where we found that lower nodule biomass in those 10 year old soils. So this is one way now that we can think that, you know, what is happening in those stockpiles and how to best potentially either inoculate them with microbial taxa to improve those restoration outcomes. Okay, and then uh, as um, a couple of years ago with Eleonora, we tried to combine some of the studies from Australia who looked at other sort of microbial community research um, applications to conservation and restoration. So we're putting together a special issue um, in plant ecology that's um, available online. If anyone wants to see other case studies and examples how this sort of research has been applied. Okay, so just now jumping to my current research, I'm going pretty long, hey? <laughs> um, <laughs> So some of my current research, there's a lot of things going on, so I'm, I won't have time to um, um, get through everything. I've added this cropping ecosystems uh, for <laughs> my future, hopefully, research in CCH as well. So the cropping ecosystems, if you, it's from my webpage, if you actually click on it, it's all about dig up there, which is that on the project. Um, but yeah, I'm still obviously continuing to work on plant invasions because this, this is why I got into science. I'm really fascinated about invasions. Um, plant microbe interactions just more generally. Um, and also during my time in Melbourne, I really got into peatland microbiology um, and coastal wetland microbiology as well. So I'll just show briefly what I've been working uh, before I came to USQ. So I really got into the peatland microbiology because peatlands are really important. Um, they cover obviously only 3% of the world's land area, but they store a staggering amount of carbon. Um, and added to that, they also play a really important role in global carbon cycling um, <clears throat> as they contain more organic carbon than actually any other terrestrial ecosystem. And we have a lot of research on microbial communities of peatlands in the Northern Hemisphere, but we know surprisingly little, at least I know, if anyone knows, let me know, but on the peatland microbiology in Australia and also Indonesia, which have, uh, like especially Indonesia has a lot of peatlands. And so this is why, what um, informs our research or motivates our research. And so for my previous position, um, so we collaborated with Jamie Lamid, who is uh, in USA in, in Syracuse University. And so he started this global project of sampling microbial communities from peatlands around the world. And we had a site in the Australian Alps in the Victoria, where we also looked at some of the intact peatlands and some of the degraded peatlands. Oh, and I guess I forgot to mention <clears throat> is that peatlands, why, why are they important? Is because they're facing uh, from climate change and from anthropogenic disturbances, uh, very rapid degradation. 
But because they store so much carbon, if they get degraded, more of that carbon will be released in the atmosphere. And so understanding the microbial processes there might also help in peatland restoration in the future. Um, so we we have one paper now that's in um, it's in review, but it's um, available as a preprint as well, where we basically found that peatland degradation reduced microbial richness and it altered the microbial functions in a way that we found that the disturbed peatland had higher uh, composition of saprotrophic fungi and pathogenic fungi as well than the natural peatlands. So, so this is um, this was the outcome of that research. And then the last last uh, example at um, with Blue Carbon Lab at Deakin University, um, they really we really they study predominantly um, so the blue carbon ecosystems, which are really those mangrove, salt marsh, and seagrass ecosystems. Uh, you might have seen recently the. In ABC, there was this article about the biggest plant in the world that was found off uh, the coast of Western Australia, which is actually seagrass, one big seagrass, which is um, pretty cool. But this research is basically informed, or the, the aim of this research is that, so we know that um, blue carbon ecosystems um, store a lot of carbon, and, um, and most of the research has been on the sort of trying to quantify how much carbon they, they store, uh, but we don't really know about the quality and stability of that carbon. So also again, with climate change and the coastal degradation, how much of that carbon will be released and what really controls its release? So basically how much of sort of recalcitrant and label carbon is there? And so the future challenge is really to understand, so what, what controls that, that formation of that blue carbon? And this all builds up on the work of Peter McCready um, that I can take no credit at all for, but my role came in where I proposed to actually look at doing a global synthesis of who is, what microbes are in those coastal ecosystems. So we don't know any, like we, we sort of know, but we don't have like a clear picture or like a review understanding what, what dominates those coastal micro, um, um, what dominates those coastal ecosystems in terms of microbial communities? And so what I'm still working on now is conducting that systemic, systematic review, uh, maybe meta-analysis on understanding who is where. Um, so, so basically ID them first and then also then assign them functions and understand what are they actually performing in those, in those coastal ecosystems. So this is some of the ongoing work we're doing. Okay, so we made the full circle. I'll come back to that first slide. And so again, I just wanna sort of reiterate what I just said at the beginning in terms of how uh, I and a lot of other, I think plant cell ecologists view um, microbes. So if we just replace humans with plants, we'll get um, this exact things that apply to basically humans apply to plants. So microbes keep us healthy. They protect us from pests. So that's why we need to study them. And we need more funding to study them because they do really drive a lot of these um, processes in the ecosystems. So that's why I put it back there and just replaced humans with plants and added outside um, the body of plant body as well. Okay, I'm tired. So <laughs> this was my talk. And obviously there's a lot of people I need to thank uh, who without whom this, all of this research would not have been possible. Um, the funders and the universities and scholarships and so forth and so on. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm really sorry that it's been like 15 minutes talk. Um, so yeah, I hope you don't hate me now. <laughs> Cheers, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we stopped recording and there's no time limit. So, okay. thank you very much for this very good introduction, Christina. I have many questions.